Welcome back to our latest episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, President, Dale Kani, Tokyo Train Japan. And my guest today is Michael Cashin, who is the Japan Country Manager for Engage Squared. That's an unusual name, Engage Squared. What, what is that all about? Uh, well, actually, one of the things we do at Engage Squared is uh, we work uh, with companies on their employee, employee engagement. Ah, so okay. It's, it's kind of coming from there. Where's the squared part coming then? So, uh, if you become engaged, you're a square sort of dude, or what is, <laughs> not what is that, that kind of squared? Yeah, you, you and us. You know, you got to what's the word? Expand everything. Yeah. Okay. Factorize it. Yeah. All right. So uh, we are sitting here in in Megaro, and you have your offices here. Uh, I'm just wondering. You've been. I think you told me you've been going for about a year and a half now. So uh, why Japan? Why this business? Uh, what sure. brought you here? Let's go yeah. some of the background on your career a little bit. Sure. So th this company is the a, um, Japanese subsidiary of an Australian company. Okay. So our headquarters are in Melbourne. We've got offices around Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and we decided um, to start a, a branch in Japan kind of late, a couple of years ago, early last year. Why is that? Australia is a pretty big place. Australia is a big place. New Zealand's a pretty big place. There's plenty of disengaged or unengaged or sure. variously engaged Aussies and Kiwis working down there. What? Uh, why sure. I mean, know? I've been in Japan a long time, so I didn't come okay. over here to start this up. Okay. I, uh, my actually, the current CEO is a, a friend of my brother. Okay. Uh, so through my brother, I met met him and got talking about it. And I was in the point where I'd been working for big companies for a long time. Uh, all in the IT space, but then in wanted... in Japan. In Japan, yeah. Okay. Well, let's wind back then. Or well, how did you wind up in Japan? Sure. Um, so I'm sure you've had some other people on on the show have had the same path as me. But I came over as a Monbusho scholar. Yeah, me too. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I came to Japan in 1997 mm -hmm. uh, on the undergraduate program. Mm -hmm. Did a year of Japanese. Uh, that was in Osaka. Then came to Tokyo and did a undergrad and. Master's in computer science okay. at uh, the University of Electrocommunications. Okay. Denki Tsushin Daigoku. Denki Tsushin Daigoku. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, when was that? I graduated from uh, the master's in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, there's always the possibility of going back, but I was, I was pretty happy in Japan. I'd already met my wife at the time. We were, we were still just, uh, just started living together when I got my first job, which was as a consultant at Accenture. Nice. Accenture Japan. So it's okay. a very prestigious job. I mean, uh, her, was, I'm was, sure her family married this foreigner and uh, <laughs> he's working for a big name corporation. It was a good idea, you know. We... Yeah, it was a good idea until I decided to quit after two years. <laughs> um, but no, she was very supportive. Family's very supportive. That's good. Um, Accenture was, was fun. I learned a lot, but it was pretty high paced. And, mm -hmm. and then I mistakenly, mistakenly felt like I could do it myself after two years. Right, of course. But there's only, there's only you know, the confidence of the young. Um, so I started my own company back then uh, with a couple of mates from my foreign students days, actually. Um, and it was going all right for a couple of months, but quickly realized I didn't have a clue what I was doing at all. <laughs> don't have a big brand like Accenture. Yeah. On um, the wall either, which helps. Right? Yeah. So, and then I, I ended up getting a, a ping one day on on Microsoft Messenger of all things, you know, from my old boss on my first project in Japan, who's like, "Come work for me on a project in Melbourne," and I'm like, "I've already quit Accenture." He's like, "Doesn't matter, just come over anyway." So I ended up moving to Melbourne for a year. Oh, that and was a half. an Accenture project in Melbourne, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, that's ironic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, it "Doesn't matter, just come over anyway." So I worked as a contractor for Accenture in Melbourne for a couple of years, and then I mean, Melbourne's a great place, great food. Yeah, nice You're originally vibe. from New Zealand. Originally right? from New Zealand. Okay, so a bit of cultural shock there. A bit of cultural there. shock. And I, I actually, to be honest, I mean, the hardest part about it was making friends. And as soon as you're like out of college, it's just, I mm. find it hard to make new friends. I don't know, maybe it's just me. But I mean, ah, I it's mean, those Melburnians. All, <laughs> all the Melburnians watching, they'll understand. Well, I'm from Queensland, so I can make that statement. <laughs> they're not that, they're tight down there. They're very tight down there. Yeah, it was, um, but it was, it was a good project. And it's kind of like, it was a massive, massive project. There's lots of expats. It's, it was good. But um, I ended up coming back to Japan, did a bit of freelance consulting, and then decided I'm sick of consulting, want to go to a you know, real company. <laughs> um, 
And seek your consulting, why? Because you're always chasing. Yeah, it's always business. just project it's, based. You, you must finish search. it, then there's the next project, and then there's the no thing. money because you're between projects and you can't hunt yeah. while you're sort of farming. And it's a complex balance of the time and then, usage, isn't it? I used to like, you know, you get, you work, at least with Accenture Project, you're generally working closer with the client. So you'd be giving them a lot of skills and knowledge mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. training them up. And all of a sudden it's like, see you later. Yeah. And all that time and, you know, effort you've put in is just, it's not really doing anything for you. Or There's your no company. residue, is there? Yeah, There's no that's, legacy that's the to continue with it. Yeah. Um, so I ended up, I was quite lucky that this is in 2010, uh, Google Japan was really hiring a lot of people, mm. um, specifically bilingual uh, people with you know technical background. So I, I, uh, I got a job there as a technical solutions consultant. Which, you know, I mean, I read these things, I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm sure it is, but, um, you know, getting into Google is harder than getting into Harvard. You read these articles like this type of thing, you know, prestigious company, tons of dough, they can select whoever they want. So, you know, having a sort of an Accenture pedigree and then having, you know, Google, you know, it's, it's impressive staff that you could, uh, you could get hired there, so that's well done. Yeah, it was, it was, it was good timing, and I think just being able to speak speak Japanese helped a lot mm -hmm. um, so all the work I did there was with with uh, you know partners and and customers in Japan uh, so yeah I, I joined Google and my first job for the first four years was working on YouTube oh. uh, so this is you know back in 2010 YouTube was not nearly as as popular as it was now mm. um, we were just trying to kind of at the start you know get the concept of creators while at the same time working with established media company media companies uh, so my role was the technical kind of support for these companies that were putting their content on YouTube. Mm. Um, and we, some we of them must have something like three. I think you know our our organisation here, Dale Carnegie Took, has got something like three thousand videos on YouTube. Like it's an incredible platform. Yeah. I mean, we. I mean, this will go on YouTube. This yep. interview will go on YouTube. So you must have been right at the start when when people weren't watching YouTube type of thing, wasn't it? Yeah, there was a lot of kind of not what's the word illegal content and so youtube built a lot of tools to kind of help the rights holders manage that where at the same time we wanted to get people used to putting their content on youtube but it's not the, the whole thing but at least you know samples or snippets or stuff so i worked with you know tv stations music labels those kind of companies to, to get their content onto youtube uh, it was it was very interesting i worked closely with the, the business team and they had some the technical discussions were always a lot easier than the business discussions. Like once the <laughs> business decision was made to get it content, I was, was literally, you know, what's the, the format for the metadata and all those nitty gritty. But the actual discussion of getting to a point where these companies that have, you know, been broadcasting over the air for 50 years want to put content on YouTube, that was, that was very interesting. Um, so I, I did that for four years. And then after that, I, I switched to Android team. Um, okay, that's sort of uh, that's quite a big jump for you going from yeah, it was a, visual medium to the the phone base. Yeah, uh, it was a uh, a big decision, but I, I was thought, Android uh, had that was that starting to be part of the start team for no, that? No, 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 it was, was it already was, underway by that time. Was, you got there? I think version would have been Eclair, which I guess is version five. So I oh, okay, so it'd been going now, for a while then, right? Was, yeah, okay. It was a few versions down, but they uh, started a new team which I did join pretty early for uh, Android Automotive, so working with the, the car industry. Oh. So one of the reasons I moved to Android was I wanted to do something more technical. Um, compared to the majority of engineers at Google, I'm very not technical because they're just you know, amazing, but I wanted to at least try and get closer to that. Um, and you know, an operating system is pretty much as technical as it gets. Mm. And I still know maybe 1% of, not even 1%, but well, tiny you're about a million bit. percent more than me. <laughs> trust me on that. You're way ahead of me. Yeah. Uh, so we we started, there was a, probably 25 people, maybe 30 people that I joined globally. And I was basically with one business guy and me in Japan. And we wanted, we reached out to the car manufacturers. The first product was, uh, smartphone connectivity. So you take mm -hmm. your Android phone, you plug it in, mm -hmm. and you can use the apps on your phone on the screen in your car. Right. Uh, so we did nice. that for a few years, and then we we switched to, um, well, we didn't switch. We added a product of the actually getting the navigation unit in the car to use a uh, Android operating system, oh, and then okay. you have right. Google Apps sitting on top of that. Right. Uh, so I don't think they've launched in Japan yet, but Honda did announce that they they're starting to roll 
roll that out in the US. Um, okay. And then Renault Nissan as well. Um, so it's, it's just the timelines on anything automotive are very long. So yeah, it's been a few yeah. years since I've left, but some of the projects that I was working on are just coming to It doesn't matter whether it's fruition. an electric motor or a fuel motor for what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's still it's pure, the, purely Android. Yeah. Android in the car is purely for mm. the, the, what they call infotainment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas anything to do with actually driving the car, that's a, a separate that's a entity, yeah. Capability. What do they call I forget what they call it, the term for this. Not, I'm going to use the wrong terminology, but it's something like the cabin or the interior. It's not the, they don't call it the interior of the car or cabin. They've got some other pretty cool name for that whole, what's on your panels, yeah. uh, you know, what's what's happening inside where you're sitting and the comfort and the, all that thing. And that's, that's there's a whole, I met someone who's actually, they work in that area supplying that for car companies. And that's a really super advanced area that's going ahead leaps and bounds with all this sort of connectivity as well. Yeah. So how long are you at Google? So altogether it's 10 years. Wow, 10 years. And then- It's so much money you could retire. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, but uh, I decided, you know, after 10 years at big companies and, and big projects before that, it would be good to, to try something new. Um, so I left Google with basically no plan. Um, ended up doing a bit of freelance consulting just to, to see what I was you know, interested in. And then you know, got a chance to speak to the, the team at Engage Squared, and it was just a, a good opportunity. You know, they had an established business uh, focused on Microsoft technology, which is interesting after 10 years at Google, but focused on Microsoft technology, helping big companies with their modern workplace. You know, how do you use these tools to actually get your, your teams working effectively? So this is like a, a measurement, uh, a measurement leveraged opportunity for companies to gauge levels of engagement. Like for example, if there's some, this would be the worst example, but compliance training, for example, and everyone hates going through the compliance training and you know how many people complete, how fast they complete, how well they complete. Um, how much work they're doing in office, out of office, you know, is it that type of thing? Is it like Big Brother watching, you know, emails? Is That's, it watching? Yeah. So, I mean, we do a lot of stuff. That's one of the things we do is is there's a, a product that Microsoft makes called Viva Insights. They've had it as a previous name. They've had it and it used to be called Workplace Analytics. You can see so I go straight to Big Brother as my yeah. name, but that's probably the wrong name, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's um, but it gives companies kind of insight about uh, how their their teams are working. Mm. Um, so, you know, how much of your time do you spend in meetings? How much yeah. of those meetings are you actually in the meeting or yeah. you're sitting there writing emails? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. How Multitasking. Much of, yeah, that's literally. Or like, goofing off. <laughs> yeah, and of those meetings, are they you know short meetings with a couple of people or are they long meetings with 20 people? Yeah. Because those yeah. meetings are very different. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's one of the, the tools that Microsoft offers and we help companies use that. Do you also do um, measurement of engagement, for example, the Gallup Corporation, which is a famous uh, company for doing the very large number of type of surveys. They always have one every year around the world on engagement scores and uh, invariably. Uh, Japan is you know, at the bottom of APAC and APAC is at the bottom of every other region in the world. And so you know, the actual number of employees who are clarified as engaged is pretty small in Japan. So is that why Engage Squared thought, oh, look at that. Japanese engagement levels are pathetically low. Here's a huge opportunity to do something and then fix that problem. Is that how the idea came about? Yeah, yeah, the, it's, that's a part of it. So why we decided that Japan would be an interesting market is obviously it's a large market for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of opportunity. Um, and then we looked at some of the existing players and they really come more from the, the IT you know, the more of the IT, the let's develop a tool and roll it out, that kind of, rather than more focused. Our company's motto is, it's a little bit corny, but I think it's actually quite good. We call it, you know, our motto is people-friendly technology. Okay. We put the people first mm -hmm. and the technology is just how you get there. Whereas mm -hmm. a lot of the players in Japan, I mean, they do a good job of making quality tools, et cetera, but they're really focused on the technology, not the people. So we're coming at it from the other side. I spend a lot of time in cabs getting to meetings and I'm just constantly amazed 
at the little you know, screens in the back of the cabs, how many videos are showing <laughs> with all of this, you know, talent um, calibration yeah, and, it, you know, knowing the, the where your place people to should be placed yeah. and, you know, they've got all these groovy, you know, using letters of the alphabet as their corporate sign yeah. and it's yeah. just, a, it's like, man, how many of these things are there? Are people actually using this stuff? So you're not really competing with that group or we're, you we're are not, competing we, with that group? No, we don't. I mean, as a company, we don't make software. We're just pure consulting. Okay. Yeah. And we try to focus on, <clears throat> yeah, every company needs something different. But coming back to the top of engagement, you know, there'll be companies that they've got the survey, meaning they might be using Wevox, which is a, you know, a good Japanese provider, or they may be using Glint, which is now part of Microsoft. Whatever provider they're using, they'll get a survey and give them information and you know, maybe they're doing it once a year and the HR team would be great. I've got these great results and they take a month and they made a nice PowerPoint and they give that to the managers and the managers, oh no, my team's not engaged. What do I do now? What do I do I will now? go drinking. <laughs> <And that's, laughs> we're not engaged, we better have a nomi guy and then we'll, we'll get out there and we'll do some drinks and everything will be done. It's not, you know, I don't think employee engagement is that simple. So we, we, we help companies who, you know, to discover these issues a little bit and then also implement, you know, actual actual improvements that they can do using the tools which is generally in big companies they'll be on microsoft teams and, and stuff like that um yeah often i think with the low engagement scores in japan uh from multinational companies anyway and it's mostly multinational companies not many japanese companies seem to bother about employee satisfaction or engagement uh, slowly that yeah they're slowly relatively, getting there. relatively yeah. right but uh, I know I've been in companies where they've had them, and there's always a couple of issues I find. One is the translation into Japanese is really critical because if it's not actually well translated, then the answers will be reflecting some confusion about what's being asked. That's one, one issue. So anyone who's watching this, who's doing engagement surveys in Japan and it's been translated, make sure you go back and check the translations very, very carefully. That's one thing. The other thing is, some of the questions are quite um, culturally sort of a little bit off target with Japan. Like one of the questions is often, would you recommend your current employer to your family members? Yeah, kind of net and friends score or something, yeah. To, to join, right? Most Japanese are very shy <laughs> about like, taking yeah. any sort of responsibility <laughs> that they introduce a family member and the family member hates the company or the company hates the family member. So their view is, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. So, but in a Western context, because you love the company so much, you want to get, you know, people in, you know, inbound and on board, Japanese companies, not so much. And I think there was one other question, I can't remember what it was now, that was unstuck in my mind, that there were like two, two critical questions that I thought, wow, culturally, that's going to be a hard road to hoe in Japan. And sure enough, the results often are quite low. And I wonder if you took those questions out or you had a different type of question where you get a totally different answer. What are you, any views on that? Saying I'm talking to an expert here? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not an expert on on kind of building these surveys. I've done a little bit of training. Um, we actually, we uh, did some training internally about the Glint product, which is it's basically they're, they're a company that started with people scientists and they, they built these questionnaires to be yeah, much more effective, you know, fewer questions so that it's easier for employees to respond. Um, and in, in some of the training, the, the first topic you're talking about, like the net promoter score of would you recommend this company, they, they've basically tried to, to step, you know, get rid of that altogether. They're like, this is not a good question globally, regardless. Oh, of globally, Japan. right. Yeah. They took it out globally. Yeah. Regardless well, of just Japan, which I, th mm. I thought was interesting. And it is... Well, you know, I don't know about New Zealand, but I think in Australia too, there's sort of nepotism as a concept that we don't like, you know. There's also, um, again, I think some accountability if you start introducing people to companies both sides, company side and also your person you introduce side, that probably Australians, I don't think, would be that keen to be introducing people to the company either. They think, well, get your own job, you know, I got mine. Get your <laughs> own job. Uh, unless, you know, you own the company and you're bringing people in. But, yeah, I wonder culturally, even in Australia, that's probably a bit of a stretch. I don't know. That's just yeah, it's a, it, it's one of the things that uh, you know, we're trying to hire people, and it's it's not easy in Japan. And then if you can avoid paying you know, recruiters' fees, you want to. I mean, they're yeah, they obviously provide a good service, but they're not cheap. Um, so one of the things you know, when our, we've got three staff at the moment, and each of them joined, we had a discussion like anyone you can recommend, and all three of them were like, 
not straight away. I can't. I got to. I got to see what this place is all about. Well, it's interesting. But, you, you, you're yeah. a startup, yeah, and uh, unknown brand in Japan because it's a startup. Yep. So hiring people, particularly foreign companies, small companies, startup companies, always a nightmare. So how do you go about convincing people to join a three-person company? Because I've run, I've run yeah. three-person companies too, and it's got a certain dynamic to it. And getting people to join, they come in and they go, "Well, I want to meet the team." Here they are. Oh, <laughs> where's the rest of them? This is it. So how do you go about getting people to come on board? Sure. Uh, the three people we've, we've got, so it's me, co-founder, and then we've hired three staff. Um, so I think, obviously, you can't not be honest. You've just got to be completely honest. And, and they say, what's your business plan? You say, this is my business plan. Whether it's going to work or not, we're going to have to figure it out together. Mm. And I, I think they, they like that. Um, we're hiring people who had experience doing what we want to do. So working in the kind of the Microsoft 365 space uh, as consultants working closely with the clients. What they didn't have and what we offered them was, you know, come in at the ground floor. You can, you know, go get projects you want to do. You can, you can do sales. You can do delivery. You can do everything. Right. And they're like, well, I've got to do everything. And I'm like, yeah, but don't you want to do everything? And they're like, oh, yeah, good point. Okay. And then the other thing was like the you know we can't say we're you know you know big international firm, but we do have a, a parent company in Australia. Mm -hmm. We're actually going out next month for like the offsite. You know they get to meet the whole team in Australia. Oh, they're all year. going to Aussie for the yeah. We're, we're all oh, going fantastic New Zealand. We've actually got an office in Bali now. We're coming over. Oh, so that's yeah. You know, that's something that you wouldn't get in a Japanese company. No. Um, no. and it's it's been good. Um, and that's you know, I had a. a podcast interview the other day with uh, Jonathan Epstein from Adyen and they're a Dutch company yep. and they've got something like 3,000 people around the world and yep. every year they all go to Amsterdam yeah. for a week. Yeah, The whole company that's for a impressive, week. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's something. So, you know, I could imagine the uh, spirit of core, the loyalty, the motivation, the commitment, the energy is just going to be at a massive peak. After an offsite like that with the whole team, they realize oh, I'm part of a bigger whole here. I think for Japanese particularly, they really thrive on that. Yeah. The only thing I'm a little worried about is they might realize just how much uh, some of our team likes to drink alcohol. <laughs> I like a drink or two, but no. I think it's uh, it's not obligatory, is it? To get no, smashed, no, it's, is no, it? no, it's, okay. it's not obligatory. It's okay. just. It's, I think they'll be all right then. Yeah. The um, We've got a pretty pretty young team. I think uh, probably pretty standard, but at least in Japan on the younger side, so it should be okay. right. Yeah. So uh, thinking about your experiences, I don't know what was the situation with Accenture or, or Google, um, or, you know, in terms of leading people. But if you look back over the time you spent in Japan, and you think about okay, um, and this is an ironic question for you as you're a consulting agency around engagement. Uh, but in your, own, in your own personal experience, what have you found works well to get teams engaged? Yep. Um, so I've, I've managed, you know, obviously managed people now, previously just small teams within uh, Google, maybe on, on the Android side. Uh, let's see. So previously I was managing very technical people and Managing technical people is generally pretty easy to get them engaged. Pretty easy. Easy to get them engaged. Because you give them okay. a problem that hasn't been solved. Right. And say, I'm, I'm trusting that you can solve this. And if you can't, come speak to me, but I'm pretty sure you can. Just go and do it. And that, that seemed to work pretty well. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact, we were you know a team of people who were managing partners. And, and nine times out of ten, it wasn't a technical problem. Or if it was a technical problem, there was an engineer whose job was to solve, so you couldn't really do their job for them. But it was, you know, finding the right person to solve it, or convincing the partner why it's important, but just taking ownership of the problem. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they had a, you know, they knew what they needed to do, they got very focused on doing that and engaged. Mm -hmm. and I don't think, at least in, in Android, there's not too many people who, who aren't engaged because it's it's a very um, fixed cycle of, you know, there was a release every year. For the release. So you're working towards yeah. that. You got a time deadline. Yeah, very, 
things have to be done and so everyone knows, okay, yeah. there's a drop dead date here, yeah. you cannot miss it. And there used to be, you know, a couple of minor releases, the major mm -hmm. release, and that's that's it. So some of that may have been forced engagement, but there was there wasn't too much people like, what am I supposed to do now? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um of the more softer side of engagement, I was lucky previously I was, you know, managing uh, you know, four or five people who are all 40 year old they've got you know 15 20 years of experience they've mm -hmm. been there done that mm -hmm. they're not they're not it's not like mentoring a you know a new grad or something mm -hmm. a couple of years out of college but the flip side of that is you're presumably younger than they are roughly the same yeah a little bit okay and so you're a foreigner yeah. um why should i listen to you you know why are you the boss? Why aren't I the boss? I mean, you know, there must be a few yeah subterranean I mean, I, thoughts going on there. Perhaps I, I think I was just you know, I had more time at Google, so that was that you was had more what's right more time at Google. Just I'd been in the oh company okay, you were, so they came okay, in they came in after you, so you had the senpai senior yeah. so that's, that's entrance status. Cool. Okay, that's always helpful in Japan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one one thing it was not so much like just outside the team it was like mentoring some of the younger people, and I I did like that piece of it. Um, we had a very global team, so I was able to you know speak to people outside of Japan who were to work on different projects, and you know they sometimes they'd come to me for advice, and I I always found that you know if you had a, you know one-on-one -on -one culture was very big and very big in Japan. I'm sure you you know you've you've studied this and stuff, but it's it's almost unheard of. We've been doing a lot of, of workshops talking about employee engagement with companies in Japan. Um, and one of the things that the product I was talking about, Microsoft Viva, Viva Insights, has a focus on is one-on-one -on -one time. Like how often are you speaking to your manager? And we'd bring up this topic in the workshop, you know, how often do you speak to the manager? And like, oh yeah, at least twice a year. And we're like, what? Twice a year, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we had to we had to we had to we had to cut it back. We actually were doing three. We had to cut it back to twice, <laughs> you know, because of time constraints. And we just could, I couldn't get my head around, but it doesn't seem like just having an honest, you know. A lot of time for a conversation where the employee or you know the junior person is bringing up topics that they want to talk about freely outside of you know ABC. You got to get done by Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Not that tactical, but the longest it just didn't happen. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So. I mean, I'm having, I'm having, I have set weekly meetings with everyone on my direct reports exactly, right? every week. Yeah. It's like, of course, you know. Yeah. And then there's always the, you know, on the fly, ad hoc, additional conversations that go on beyond that, but. I wouldn't dream of having anything less than weekly, you know, but amazing twice yeah. a year. Like, okay, good so, luck with that one. Well, I used to have these one-on-ones with with them, with uh, people who weren't my direct reports, and they they found it very useful because they could just kind of get stuff off their chest. And that's what's one of the things I did like about Google was the one-on-one culture. Well, what, what's you know, given that your company is a consulting business around this whole area. What would be some advice you'd give managers, leaders here about engagement, how to get their team engaged? Buying the tools, of course, that's a given. Yeah. That's a given. We'll buy the tools from uh, from you guys. But just in terms of their you know, people side of things, any things that you've noticed that work particularly well? I mean, the one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, I would I would take that as a, a given. Yeah. I don't think that's going to be, well, maybe for Japan it'll be revolutionary. But for most, particularly foreign leaders, that would not be a revolutionary thought. But what things would you recommend to people to get higher levels of engagement from their team, apart from the nomikai and meeting yeah. twice a year? Yeah. Um, one, this is a, I don't think this is a revelation either, but one of the things we did copy when we started from uh, the Australian office, and this was kind of to get people back in the office in Australia because everybody got very used to working from home. Mm -hmm. Like if you come to the office, we'll buy your coffee. Uh -huh. and the, okay. the Australian the team you announced this at one of our regular meetings and the Japan team's like yeah we'll do that I'm like what you're, like, you're coming to the office anyway and they're like don't care give me a coffee <laughs> but it's, it's actually worked out really well as a you know chance to, to get a coffee uh, increase Starbucks you know sales by a couple of thousand yen every every day but um because there's starbucks right over oh, the road yeah, yeah i was yeah. there this morning actually yeah. i came a bit early so so we got i was cooling my heels there but it's just a, a good way to get um yeah, a chance every day to have a bit of an informal chat, um, which is which is important, I think. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, 
being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers. Do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. Well, I'm thinking something a bit more, a bit more technical. I'm thinking something along the lines of uh, there's always an alignment between the individual's career uh, aspirations, ambitions, and the company's direction. And as a leader, you're always trying to make sure that those things are in unison and are aligned, that people feel that the work they're doing is advancing their professional abilities, their career, and it fits in with where the company wants to yep. go. I mean, if, you're, if they're going one way and the company's going another way, there's got to be a disaster, so they've got to be in line. But often uh, with leaders, we, we forget the why piece, you know, um, and we might talk about the what they should be doing and might even get to the how they should be doing it, but often we forget to talk about the why and relate back to purpose. And so part of the engagement is having a very clear sense of what the company stands for, what's the purpose, what's the direction, where do I fit into that? And even though I may feel that my role is not particularly significant, my boss doesn't make me feel like that. My boss makes me feel that actually you are a, an important part of this process and this team and we value you. So that's what I was thinking, something more along those lines. So what's your reflection on, on that? Yeah, I think we do nothing that's that's amazing, but we, we make sure we have a clear you know, value, mission, et cetera. We manage our goals as a team. We align them up with with you know, global, and then we manage them in, as OKRs, which is what I was used to at Google. It's also what we do internally. I think Microsoft, lots of big companies use it. Um, and because we're all, you know, we'd, we kind of, you know, we've got five people here, but we're probably running more than five, you know, maybe 10 or so little projects at once, you know, starting and stopping, whatever. Um, it's, it's easy for people to take ownership. And then we just have a, you know, a meeting every week. We talk about how the projects are going, share issues, make sure we're, we're all on track. So we're kind of like collaborating throughout the day with different people. You know, this project will be with this guy, this project will be with this guy. And then just everyone's got ownership but you're not working by yourself, which mm. I think is, mm. is important. Because we could say, okay, you're going to do this project from start to finish. Just tell me when to send the invoice and you take care of the rest, right? Mm -hmm. And that would be very, I think, demoralizing because mm. like, why am I part of this company again? Yeah, you're in isolation there. Yeah. And then we actually, we, we do try and loop in Australia and I have to say they've been very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why you, you, start, you choose to start a, a business with a parent company is so that you can leverage that. Mm. So being able to leverage not just their Microsoft partnership but also you know interactions to people in japan and then kind of assets for how to run projects we did uh, we did some research on this uh, some years ago and we found that uh, there were sort of like three um three levels that were important uh one was your uh, belief that your relationship with your manager was working because your manager felt that they cared about you and you felt that they cared about you. That was one level. So you're obvious, it's an obvious one. Your relationship with your immediate supervisor, very, very key. Second one was the belief of the people at the bottom in the direction that the top leadership is setting, that you actually think they know what they're doing. This is the right direction. Yes, I should follow this. The third one was the uh, pride in the organization. It sounds like an obvious one, except that in, I'm sure you've struck this in big organizations, often you have powerful division heads who are 
elbowing each other out of the way to get to the top job. And they're using their divisions as weapons uh, against other divisions, you know, and suddenly you have this internecine feud between divisions in the company as two powerful leaders jockey for position. And so the pride in the company is destroyed because they're fighting internally instead of fighting with the enemy outside. So those were three things we found. We found that that feeling valued was the trigger to get people to become more confident, uh, take risks, have more belief, uh, to you know all of the engagement aspects you want was triggered by that feeling that I am valued here. So what has been your, your experience with helping people to feel valued by you as the leader? Yep. Uh, I think I've been lucky in that I've hired people with skills that I don't have to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people with more technical experience in, in the area we're working in around the Microsoft 365 products. I mean, I've caught up over the last year, but a year ago I was, I was still in the process of catching up. So telling people and then people believing when they say that you're better than me at this, I think is is a good way to, to make them feel valued for sure. And then I think we've been lucky in that our, so far and hopefully forever, our clients have been very happy and they, they give us feedback that they're very happy and mm -hmm. you know, they give us more work. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's, you know, a feedback, you know, a client might tell you that, oh, thanks for the project, did a great job. And then if they delete you from their contact book, then maybe you didn't do such a great job, they're just being very nice. Mm. Um, being if, polite as yeah. they say bye bye yeah yeah, yeah but we're a polite farewell getting repeat work where there's work you know work to do um which is is good and then i think yeah just letting letting them take risks and then being there to back them up because mm -hmm. i think as a startup you've got to you know we have a chat and we're like well, have we done this project before no has australia done something before something similar, maybe the exact same project. No, well, we're gonna do something we've never done before. And they'll be like, ooh, it sounds scary. And I'm like, what are we here to do? We're here to do, you know, we're here to start something and, and make everything gonna be new. And let's just take the risk and if we screw it up, we'll we'll fix it. Um, and that's interesting, you know, because you've been here a long time. How many years have you been in Japan now? 25. 25, right? Yeah. So you know, after 25 years that no defects, no errors, no mistakes is the Japanese business culture. And so here we are in every company, if we want to do something new, oh, that's not usually greeted with enthusiasm in Japan, right? Oh, yeah. that could be uh, dangerous because it might go wrong. Uh, I might be associated with the failure. It might impact me. I'm not happy about that. New things, stay away from that. That's a good idea. Or uh, something's got a risk attached to it. Oh, I don't like that either. So you know, having to step out, take a risk, do something that's never been done before, how do you assure people, how do you comfort them to know that uh, a failure uh, is not failure, it's learning or, you know, mistakes can be corrected, we learn from that or something you really screw it up. It's not a career ending moment for you because we're in a yeah. discovery phase here with what we're doing as we branch out. Because I think for Japanese particularly, they have to be told that and also not only told it, but they watch. You know, if you, the classic is, yes, we're going to go forth and do new things and, you know, experiment. And they do. And then it goes wrong. And then it's a clip under the ear <laughs> for doing something wrong. And, and they're like, oh, my God. You know, so then everyone just back into the shell and they never come out again. So yeah. how do you encourage that? Yeah. Overcome but, that fear. But, yeah. I was lucky in that in my time at Google, I went from YouTube, entertainment industry, not a lot of talk about risk. I mean, as long as you don't. You know, have some scandal. That was basically the only risk you talk about in the internet, where you can't, you, the risk you're not going to sell, the risk is going to be some unforeseen scandal. Went from that industry to automotive industry, where they're like, you know, what's your, what's your defect, number of defects in Android? And well, we have four categories, we have showstoppers, and then we have anything else. <laughs> and actually, yeah, we only have two because there's showstoppers or there's anything else, and we're going to launch anyway. And they're like, what do you mean you launch with bugs? And we're like, we're Android. Haven't you heard of us? <laughs> you know, we're getting better every time. But um, just the whole concept of having bugs in software and then releasing was like, no way. What's going on? So yeah. that was, that was, I did, had a lot of very interesting discussions and, and they kind of they came around. I think because we we're in infotainment, you can't, 
compromise on safety anyway relating to well that's right an infotainment is not going to have a car having a smash unless yeah. you're watching the screen instead of watching the road but yeah yeah okay but then coming back to the the company i mean in the end we're still you know we've got our parent company if if we really screwed up we'd be like hey guys <laughs> we need some people we need some money i think that's you know one of the reasons you're there but in consulting i mean I think you know we, we do some small to medium scale software development, and I think the biggest element of risk in that is you get the you know your sizing wrong. And if you're on a fixed price contract and you think it's going to cost a hundred grand and it ends up costing two hundred grand, well you say we'll do better next time. And you you take the hundred grand and you hope you get more work from that client, or you can you can reuse what you learn. We need to send them another invoice. Well, I mean sometimes Here's the adjusted you got, invoice. <laughs> yes, I mean it depends how you. Yeah, you know, if you signed off on the requirements and this is what we're going to build, it's going to cost this much, and then it doesn't, then that's kind of but your fault. But in Japan, though, I mean, you know, the contracts are yes, um, okay, watertight, iron bound for certain big companies and big industries, but a lot of cases in Japan, the person you're contracting with on their side will come back and then get you to do things outside the contract and uh, or change the details of the, because their situation has changed. They say, well, the situation, yeah, well, yes, when we signed that, that was true, but yeah. our situation has changed, so we need a new contract. And they have no hesitation to ask you. Now, in an Australian litigious uh, legal environment, you would say, no, 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 okay. we signed a contract. Change, change request, please. This yeah. is this is it, you know, this is what we do. But in Japan, it's okay. In certain industries, certainly big companies, yes, I'm sure that's the case, but most companies are not large here. And so you always got that adjustment that they want to make. And um, I think there's a certain level of flexibility here, at least from the buyer side to the supplier side. I don't know it goes so much the other way, but... There is a little bit of a gray area there that maybe, you know, you can have a bit of flexibility and say, hey, listen, when we sign this contract, this was like this, but there's, you know, energy prices has gone through the roof or, you know, supply chain has been impacted or labor costs have, you know, become very difficult because you can't get the staff, can't get the resources. We need to adjust this. And that's a negotiation. That's a discussion as opposed to, no, 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 no. You signed it. That's it. Which is probably more of a Western mentality. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Mm. So a little bit of flexibility there. So yeah. what about uh, getting ideas from people? You know, you were in um, technical areas, uh, engineers coming up with, with solutions, uh, getting people to pop up with ideas. I'm sure it's an idea fest here every day because you're a <laughs> startup. You've got to you know get into the market. There's no roadmap. There's no procedures that you know, has gone before precedent. Who the hell knows what's going to work? We've got to try a lot of things and see which ones do work. So we need ideas. But often, uh, as the boss, we often are the source of most of the ideas. And the temptation there is, because you're, you know, you've got a high degree of ownership of the business, your brain is really thinking at a very high level all the time. So the ideas are pouring out. And sometimes we don't allow the team to bottom up ideas because we're just pouring out ideas constantly. So how do you balance that? Yeah, uh, I think in, in terms of ideas, we there'll be kind of like two levels of ideas. There's like literally strategic ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously you go up and down in sales, and when we're you know heading down, we want to come up with ideas to get new new work. Um, and then there's the more the like, how do I make this project a success level of ideas? In terms of how do I make this project a success, I think we really we want to make sure that everybody knows what the project is trying to do. So let's say, for example, we're in a, you know, we're working with a big Japanese financial institution. We're helping them rebuild their employee portal. Pretty important. I mean, they've got tens of thousands of staff. They're going to go to this thing every day. And, you know, we want to make sure that that's a success. So we will get in there and we will do a workshop um, with the, the customer. But we'll kind of, before we do the workshop with the customer, we'll do a workshop internally and, just make sure we're actually, you know, we know where we're heading in case the mm -hmm. customer sits there in the workshop and they're like, tell us what we need to say. Because then it's, yeah. Um, in terms of more strategic stuff, it's, I don't think anyone has the the right answer. So just try and be as flat as possible. I think we're, we're very lucky though, because consulting, you can come up with an idea and you don't have to go build a $10 million factory to execute it. Yeah. 
So we've been doing, like I mentioned earlier, we've been doing workshops with a lot of companies and we're like, well, it'd be good to, to meet some new companies. We, we set an internal target of, I think, meeting three potential clients that we hadn't met before a month. It just doesn't sound like a lot, but it's you've got to meet three companies who have a, a zero, you know, greater than 0% chance of buying services from you. You kind of, you work through your Rolodex the first six months and you call out your old mates from Accenture and like, yeah, and then you kind of, you hit a, oh, we actually need to go meet new people. So one of the ideas we came up with, well, let's do like a, instead of doing workshops one by one, let's do a joint kind of workshop, workshop slash, you know, networking event. And it was literally, we had the, the idea on a, on a Monday meeting, the next day I pinged my, you know, my contact at Microsoft, it's like, let's do this. I said, oh, that's a great idea. Done. And then, you know, we wrote up a one page proposal. She shared it with a few kind of key stakeholders inside Microsoft, I'm like, sounds like a good idea. And it's happening next week. We're doing it in oh, well Osaka and, and Tokyo. Well done. That's a lot of, and then once so we, we, yeah, we call that group prospecting. Yeah, exactly. But the, you know, the one page proposal was easy. Now coming up with the whole three hour. Yeah. What's going to be in there? It's a lot of work it is. Uh, considering we know we're not charging anyone, but and there's only a few of you here to do it too. Yeah. yeah but yeah. we should come out with you know, a dozen new mm. contacts. Yeah. With great people idea. Who are at least interested. And great it's, idea. um, we, we decided to focus on, and I think this was actually the Microsoft idea. It was like, let's invite people. And they're like, what kind of people? I'm like, uh, people who work at big companies. Like, How about HR people? Because they're employee engagement. Yeah, often HR of, is often, responsible. Yeah, it starts with- yeah, Line managers. Yeah, and it, often Microsoft ha has a lot of contacts in the IT department, obviously, but they want to they speak to HR people. And we want to speak to HR people, so let's focus on HR. So we're, mm. we're going to get contacts with HR. To, I mean, if Microsoft companies. is reaching out to you to have put on a, a seminar, on engagement, uh, and they're contacting HR people. And it's Microsoft, you know. I mean, uh, Engage Squared never heard of them. Microsoft heard of them. Yeah. And that's you know a much easier yeah. way to get people to come, isn't it? And then they meet you, and you're the expert. So that makes a lot of sense. Yes, you're under that yeah. umbrella, which is a smart move. It's a great idea. In terms of uh, trust, you know, if you think about Japan, you've been here 25 years. You know that trust is important everywhere. But uh, for me, I'm always astonished that Japanese make a lot of decisions based on trust rather than logic. And I know this because when I'm interviewing people for jobs and I look at their resume and you're going through, you know, why'd you leave this company? Why'd you go here? Often people say, well, my previous boss called me. Now, that's not a logical decision. No. You know, that's yep. not a lot. They've already got a, a job here, but they've got an emotional connection with their previous boss who called them. So they quit this company. They join the boss. The, it's often a foreign company who then closes shop here. Now they're out of a job. They're back on the market again. So you get these things in their resumes, you know, they're jumping around. And so I often think to myself, wow, that's a very emotional way of looking at things. So uh, if you think about, you know, trust is such a critical thing here. How do you build trust? with the team members in your previous iterations and also now? Sure. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that I, I like the, the stuff to do, you know, to, I told them that they can do stuff that I can't do, mm -hmm. but I think there's also the opposite, opposite of you've got to be able to show them what you can do. Yeah, you to, you've got to know something, right? Yeah, yeah. you've got to know something. You can't just be the kind of leader who's like, do this, do that without actually showing them and, you know, making sure that you can do what they, you know. Mm -hmm. And as a, um, a foreigner, I, I think it is, I'm lucky that I, I speak Japanese. So it means that I can go and do the stuff in Japanese if I have to. Yep. I, yeah, I'm used to working in Japanese, which I think is something that other foreign leaders, you know, they might be able to do, they might be the best salesman ever, but if the guy that got to sell go through the translator. Japanese, yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. So I think showing them what you can do is, is one thing. Um, and then building trust. I mean, in both big companies and small companies, I've always tried to keep it very, I mean, I've never been in a serious company. I mean, Google's, you know, it's pretty. It's I've pretty, never been in a serious well, company. Well, Accenture, 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 Accenture I guess, is not pretty, serious companies. Accenture was <laughs> ser serious. Accenture companies. was serious. I take that back. Accenture was pretty formal, but there was always the, the us and them. It's not the nice way of saying it, but you could always have a joke with your, your Accenture buddies. Right. Maybe at the client's expense, maybe with the client. And then Google's very, you know, trying not to be too, too, what's the word, too um, formal internally. 
and I've, I've, I've kept that here. Um, we try to be nice and friendly and, and just, you know, people, real people. I think being real is important. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then, how does how does that come across? You know, like you say, keeping it real, being real. What does that mean for an employee? How do they recognize that you're being real? What's the difference from not being real? You know. Sure. I mean, I guess it. Actually, it's a funny story. I was on a, a call with a, a a TV station, which I thought was interesting. So this is the first time I've kind of spoken to someone in this new role that I would have worked up when I was at, at Google. You know, worked with a lot of TV stations, and they're like, we're building an employee portal and being a TV station. They're planning like a year in advance, and we're like, we're speaking to potential companies to help us. We're not actually going to do anything for the next six months. And we're like, it was me and, and one of my uh, team on the call, and he is like this, and I'm like this. And he's like, actually, Michael, no, that's not right. Blah, 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 blah. And he just corrected me in front of the client. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Yeah, we're trying mm. to. But he, didn't, he didn't like say you're completely wrong. He's like, that's kind of right, but it's actually this and this. And the Japanese guy's like, what? Isn't like Michael like the shacho? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, but you guys are very friendly. And I'm like, yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> and he just couldn't believe that, you know. A uh, subordinate would yeah, correct the boss. You correct the client. boss or just even them mm. tell a joke about me. It was just, and it was like, mm. I was like, yeah, but he knows what he's talking about. Let him talk. I'm like, oh, mm. okay. <laughs> well, that um, is that is quite antithetical to how things normally work out. I mean, yeah. I, I, it's a, not exactly the same story, but uh, I tell of every company I've worked in here, I've told my staff, look, you know, I know my Japanese is not perfect, and I know that I'm probably making the same mistakes over and over again because <laughs> I don't know that it's a mistake. So if you hear me say something in Japanese that's not right, just let me know, and I'll correct it, and I'll work on that. In 38 years here, <laughs> nobody <laughs> has ever corrected the boss on grammatical mistakes in Japanese that he's making, and he just keeps making the same ones forever, and they just overlook it. So getting the subordinates to correct you is not that easy so well done <laughs> well you've done a much better job of that than i've managed to do so congratulations to you and that comes to a little bit of the session around culture too because if you think about uh, you've got a startup here you're actually building the culture now you might have a culture you know in bali and a culture in you know australia and new zealand etc that's fine but you're here and you're it you're running the show here so um, you're actually creating the culture from zero. So what were your thoughts about, okay, what, okay, we're going to do the startup, we're going to have a, some type of culture here, what sort of culture do I want, and how am I going to arrive at that culture that I want to achieve? What were your thoughts about that? Yeah, so my, my co-founder Nobu and I, we, we, we did um, talk about this, you know, once we, we figured out we were going to be able to hire people and the first person was coming on board. Um, so I think we we wanted to just, not be, and I don't think you could really be, even if you tried, but the standard, you know, very hierarchical Japanese company, mm-hmm. we didn't want to be that. Yeah. Um, and we wanted people to to feel like they could grow. Mm-hmm. Um, we wanted people to tell us when they weren't happy, just be open with the communication. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think they do a good job of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, but nothing, not always, nothing groundbreaking. That's I mean, not always it's, easy. Though. I mean, you say yeah. that, you know, I give an example. When people join my company, particularly women, um, I tell them, I said, look, if I'm saying or doing anything that you don't feel comfortable or good about, tell me. And what I, what I say to the women is, I'm a guy. Uh, women are a mystery to me. <laughs> and I'm also Australian, so my cultural background is quite different. So things that would not um, come on my radar screen that would be an issue might be an issue for you as a woman and as a Japanese person. So don't hold back. If you tell me, then I'll recognize it and I'll fix it. And yet, you know, I had a situation where one of my team was going to leave because she perceived that the direction we were going wasn't where she wanted to go. And she wanted to change the job designation and thought that it couldn't be changed. And when I was doing the exit interview, and this came up, well, you know, what, why are you leaving? And she said, well, why don't you just talk to me about that? We can change your job designation right now. What are you talking yeah. about? You know, and I told oh, you no. when you joined, yeah. you know, if you have a problem, you come and talk. 
but she didn't, right? And then we changed the job designation. She's happy. She's still there. No, she stayed. Working. She stayed. That's yeah. impressive. Getting she someone stayed. to stay in the exit interview. Yeah, well, that's the <laughs> only one that's ever done that. I have to tell you. So I can't say I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hitting a home run every time I have an exit interview. That's the first one that's ever actually stayed. But, but it was just something for me. Even though I had made that comment, made yeah. that statement, and thought that people understood it, maybe she didn't believe me when I told her that because it was a entry position, you know, of the first interview when we are on board, right, uh, when she'd actually signed on and maybe, you know, she'd forgotten about it or something, I don't know. So getting people to actually uh, take that on board and believe it and work with it is not necessarily a straightforward thing. You have to keep repeating the idea that actual fact, you know, uh, yep. you have flexibility here. Yeah. If you're going to give some advice to someone who's being sent to Japan, okay, um, you've got to go to Japan, run the operation there. Um, and they called you up and say, Michael, look, I've got this job. I'm going to come to Japan. I'm going to run my organization here. I don't know Japan. I don't know Japanese. What advice would you give me to be an effective leader? What would you tell them? Sure. Uh, for the easy one that we mentioned is make sure there's a culture of one-on-ones. Um, I think you should be able to, as a, as a, you know, a director or a team lead, at least do skip level one-on-ones. So you're not just getting everything filtered through your direct reports, assuming mm-hmm. that you're, you're head of a big team. Uh, I, I still remember actually it, when I um, was on YouTube, so 10 years ago, there was like kind of, I guess, my boss's boss's boss came over, had a, a one-on-one with me, and then kind of, I think six months or a year later, he came over for another business trip, had another one-on-one with me, and he had notes from my previous one-on-one in front of him. Ooh. Like last time we talked, I'm like, what? what? <laughs> I don't even remember meeting you six yeah. months ago. I'm, this is like, content. I'm one of probably 500 guys in this, wow. you know, 500 people in this guy's team. Um, so that was impressive. But just That is impressive. Yeah. He was actually an ex, ex-Navy top was he? fighter guy. So was pretty, he? pretty motivated guy. Yeah. Um, and well-organized too. Yeah, well-organized. I mean, that, that's, um, that was impressive. So I think, but just making sure you... you you're getting information from the team. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say learn Japanese, but that's always going to be a hard one. But even I think this goes for any any you know most culture most most cultures. If you take the effort to at least learn a few phrases, it's a good, it's a good start. Well, there's always a big cultural uh, component in the language study, isn't there? I mean, you're yeah. trying to understand your team just by even maybe not any degree of particular fluency in the language, but just the knowledge of, of language gives you insight into the culture, which helps you to understand people and why they operate yep. the way they are. And often um, small knowledge, you know, like when the classic is, you know, shall we shall we do this? I think this would be a good idea. Hey, and imagining that, that means yes, because you, <laughs> you in your language class, hi equals yes. yes. But as you get to know the culture a bit, you realize hi means I am listening to you. <laughs> I can hear you clearly. Uh, yeah. I don't agree with you, but I can hear you. And so, you know, those nuances around, well, actually, I don't agree with you. Um, yeah. So I always think that cultural component is, is a handy thing to get through the tool of the language, actually. Yeah, if you've been married to a Japanese uh, woman for a while, you know that hi hi does not mean <laughs> does not mean anything positive at all. <laughs> hi hi. <laughs> um, but it's a good point about the the culture. So I think, and this isn't every textbook out there, but literally the way of making decisions and and it's it's not top down, it's bottoms up, mm-hmm. and it's consensus. It's it just sounds so corny, but it is it is how it happens. I mean, mm. the guy's actually doing the bulk of the. You know, the planning and decision making might be the the lower layer or the the second layer, like you know the kacho or that that level. And if you're the you know the hombucho or the big director or whatever, you've got a couple of layers in between. And you speak to the guy next to him, well, he's you know, you've got to go down the train before you actually get the people who are making the decisions and and the planning. Um, I think that would be that would be a lot different. Um, and then I think. This is, if it's, you know, assuming you're a global company, I think the one change you could really make is um, just passing more information on. All the good managers I've had, they, they just passed as much information on yeah. as, as, as possible. And it's, you just feel like you're, we talked about it, you know, you feel like you know what you're, you're supposed to do. You feel like you're an important part because 
you know, your team, your company might have a list of 50 priorities and on one of those priorities, you're the third bullet point, but that's you. And if your boss doesn't tell you, you know, if your big team boss doesn't tell you that that's one of the priorities for the entire company and that's all on you guys and you don't feel like you're actually doing anything at all. Um, and that's where OKRs can be a, a good because if, if you do them as a whole company, you can structure it so that everything that it rolls up, it's not, it's not easy it's at all. It's a good point because, you know, and I'm guilty of this too, to be honest, you know, like the, um, the people at the top, section head, division head, you know, senior executives, whatever, um, they're all absorbing information from the top, right? Yep. Be the global headquarters yep. or from the president's office or the uh, executive's office or whatever. And particularly the sort of cut-your level, the sort of section head level, tend not to pass it on. They tend to be the reciprocal, not the receptacle, I should say, not reciprocal, receptacle of all this information, knowledge and uh, you know, data, etc. But they tend to keep it either as a power play or they just don't think to pass it on. And this is, I'm guilty of this sometimes, they don't pass it on. But you're right, to pass on stuff to the people below so that they know what's going on, you know, yeah. and uh, share that information with people so they appreciate, you know, the sort of the inner the inner sanctum of what's actually happening in the company. They, they like to know that because it gives them yeah. insight into what's going on and they feel, okay, I'm plugged in. And uh, I have to keep reminding myself that I have to, you know, like, for example, um, I'd go to a convention, I'd come back, that's it. How was the commission? I was there. How was the commission? It was oh, hot. It was good. Yeah, it, was <laughs> it was hot. Was hot. We hot. drank a lot of beer. It was good. But I, you know, now I realize, I come back, I think, this is what happened. This is what I learned, you know, and really pass that on to people, which I, you know, I recognize I wasn't doing that. So that's, uh, I think, an important part of sharing, isn't it? Yeah. Anything else? Uh, just giving credit where credit's due mm -hmm. and just you know, calling out if it was a team that did it, call out the whole team, not mm -hmm. one person. Mm -hmm. If it was one person, don't be afraid to say they're doing a good job. Um, well, in, that, uh, in that regard, you know, for example, as a Western leader, you know, Michael, coming up to the front. Michael's our top producer this month, everyone. Let's recognize Michael, you know, which would be a very Australian, probably Kiwi way of doing things, right? But for a lot of Japanese, like they're like, oh, no, I don't want to go up there and be recognized and be singled <laughs> out and be put above everybody else. And I know the knives are going to come out any moment now. People will be dissing me in small groups and putting me down to get me back into line with everybody else. So... You know, that whole cultural thing here is a bit of a nightmare. And, and yeah, I will admit I've, I've really been in more technical organizations mm -hmm. where even if you're getting singled out, you're getting singled out because you've been focused on a very narrow area that's not, you know, you've done good work building this piece or delivering this project as opposed to where sales, where yeah. your sales may have actually been at the cost of someone else. So yeah, yeah. I, might, I might be a little bit naive in, those, in that space, but I still think it's better to at least tell people they're doing well, good I guess job. the point there is how do you communicate it? For example, yeah. I've, I've learned that there are certain individuals, personalities, come up the front of the room, Japanese, they're happy with that. Yeah, everyone look at me. I'm, all, I'm, <laughs> I'm awesome, right? Some are like that. Others, it's a lunch. Michael, I want to invite you for lunch. You've done a great job. And yeah, let's get together. Point. And it's, yeah. it's sort of like not public, but people sort of know you know, see you leaving together to go to lunch or Michael, you know, Michael's going with Greg to lunch. You know, why aren't I going to lunch with Greg, you know, type of thing sort of. But uh, that tends to be, I guess, horses for courses in terms of how you deliver the message. Yeah. Yep. So uh, what's your definition of leadership, Michael? Uh, my definition of leadership is first you've got to know where you're going. Mm -hmm. So you've got to have your own roadmap mm -hmm. and that'll be, yeah, you know, everyone's got to have that. You've got to be sure you can get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I started this company by myself. I found a co-founder, and I'll, you know, first six months, zero sales, zero connections. I'm like, ah. but I still, I knew, you know, the business in Australia is successful. I knew the market is there. You just got to be sure you can, you can get a, you know, get there. So you're gonna. Know where you want to go. Be sure you can get there, even if you don't actually know how you're going to get there. And then you've got to have the confidence to try various things. And 
Nob and I, we spoke to you know, dozens of people and we, we quickly realized, you know, there's no point in speaking to small companies because they just don't have the IT budgets. So we need to focus on big companies. How do you get to big companies? Well, if there's only one way we're going to get there, we need to get closer with Microsoft. And we just put a lot of hmm. effort in, in making connections with the team at Microsoft and proving to them that we can do good work here uh, as well as what we've done overseas. Um, so even if you don't know how you're going to get there, you know, you've got to have the confidence to try and do it. So leadership is is about showing that, and then it's it's convincing people to join you. Um, that's the mm. biggest the biggest thing is that's why you you build a company is so you can do something that one person can't you leverage. Yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, for other startups, uh, they may know this, they may not know this. And you mentioned to me before we went on uh, on the mics that you spent a hundred work days, hundred working days at Jetro. Yep. In uh, Akasaka and their uh, their quarters there, they've got a special section there, I guess, for yeah. startups. So uh, no rent, no no yeah, fees, it was free, right? So free for the first having half, six yeah. months or so of no income when you don't have any rent going out makes it's, it a bit easier, doesn't it? So for yep. people who are startups and you're looking for a way to get into uh, the the business and keep your costs down, that might be contact Jetro and see if they can uh, help you out there. Yeah. With a bit of a, a leg up at the beginning. I know they've. They've just done renovations as well. Have so, they? Oh, yeah. so it's even more gorgeous than it was before. <laughs> well, Michael, this has been great. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. Lovely to hear what you've been doing and good luck for the success. of. Uh, there's a big need for higher levels of engagement in Japan, I'm sure. Yep. And you're going to be the pivot point to make sure that happens. <laughs> cool. So join us again for our next episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews.